So, uh, my name is Jan Teerling. I'm with Celligent. I'm going to take the user here. I come from Belgium. Um, I plan to go back tomorrow. I mean, if I listen to my two previous colleagues, I probably will not go to a bar tonight in Dublin then, <laughs> because it's dangerous. They both came from abroad and they, and they stayed there. I love the country, not about that, but... Um, anyway, um, I'm not going to talk about my platform. I want to avoid this to be a sales pitch. I want to talk about something which I think is very relevant for this type of conference, and I will explain why. But th th this is what I'm going to talk about, bridging the gap between relationship marketing and digital performance marketing. Let me explain first what I mean with that, and then why I think and hope it's an interesting topic. A very, very basic um, schema. But what I want to show here is that if you look at marketing departments, there are typically two types of disciplines. And when we talk a lot about Facebook this afternoon and so on, all very interesting, we tend to forget that um, what I call two types of disciplines is, first of all, there are people who are brilliantly in working with the corporate database, meaning all your customers you have in there, all the contacts, even contacts who just registered by, uh, by just signing up for a newsletter. But the point is, these people are addressable, you know their name, and the goal of this type of people is to grow the value of the people they already know, known contacts. Meaning from, um, if I just subscribed only, the only goal is making me do that first buy. If I made that first buy, the only goal is getting that repeat buy in. That's what these people do, what they're very good at. And even five years ago, if you would talk about data-driven marketing, what would be the conferences where those people go? It's like the DMA, you know, the Direct Marketing Association, because data-driven marketing was actually in the past years always limited to this side of the world, and I call that the customer ID world. But another group within the marketing department is those people who are on the other side, and they say, I do not need to know your name to make you a good offer. They live in a different world, and we used to call that a couple of years ago, that's traffic. I mean, the people dealing with it were traffic managers and so on. But the point is, they work with anonymous people, and they understand the art of getting the right traffic onto the uh, online real estate, your website, in order to get the maximal conversion out of that. But the other word typically used for that type of people are the direct response people, meaning they see their activity as a success when the moment you land and you buy immediately and they see that on the figures in the web analytics. But the reason why I uh, want to talk about this is that there is a great evolution ongoing that these two worlds are coming together, but very often the people who are in those different departments very little know about what the other side are doing. It's really like two separate divisions. And now the why I think it's interesting to talk about this is when Niels reached out to um, talk about this conference, I think what's unique about this conference is that you have representatives from both worlds. Uh, the Nanigans and Propel at what you saw previously, is all what's happening on that side. And then more Marketo and Eloco and us, it's all what's happening on this side. And that's just where I wanted to show you a bit like where these bridges are. So in essence, it's about, um, in marketing automation, two different worlds. Um, those who work with the anonymous and those who work with the known contacts. But they all have the same goal. At the end of the day, what they want to reach is optimized content so you would buy. And the ones on the left side um, tend to call that advertisement. But I want to add to that in a minute that it doesn't have to be just advertisement. The point is that the dream of those people is that at the end of the day, when you see an ad that it's so relevant that you're just happy to see that and don't see that anymore as an advertisement. Um, but both worlds are completely data-driven. Now. Just to explain a bit about us, Saligent, on which side are we? Well, we are on the right side. We are a multi-channel campaign management. We have offices in all these um, uh, lovely cities, about 400 clients. Um, the difference with, for example, Marketo and Eloco is that we are really into the B2C. So brands reaching out directly to uh, consumers. And the reason why I mention that is, and in the previous conversation, it's a lot about feeding salesmen and so on. This is really a brand directly communicating to the end client. To give you some idea, um, some names, we work for Samsung, very proud of doing that, um, a Desigual, for example, an Ikea, um, that type of companies. Yeah. Um, 
let me first ask a question. When I show the left side and the right side, I, I would like to know who lives in that customer ID world, the left side. So it's called CRM people, database marketeers, relationship marketing. Who lives in that world? And I have to come closer because the lines come in. Just for me to see what the, 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 the representation is. So, okay. And let's see the other world, the advertisement, data-driven advertisement world. Okay. And I'm trying to add up, like uh, Daniel said from Eloqua, the rest can't be IT people. <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't matter. It must be the bookkeepers then. Okay. Now, um, the point is, for those who are not into marketing automation in the customer world, just to summarize what marketing automation in essence does, according to us, and whether it's our tool or another tool, this is what it brings. Starting from a central single view, you want to analyze the top left corner and find those interesting, high-valuable customer segments. The second thing you want to do is you want to create great interaction with them so that you have the engagement so that they start buying. A key thing for marketing automation is the fact that you can easily execute it timely and across all the channels. And while doing that, there has to be optimization features in there like A-B testing, multivariate testing, uh, marketing pressure optimization, and so on. Um, and again, for those who are not yet using a marketing automation tool, the typical things when um, companies start doing that is when they are, let's say, a bit bored of having all these problems on the left side. You know, everybody has an email tool, so everybody can send an email. Everybody can personalize an email. Everybody has a database where they can make a selection, throw it in a channel, and wait until something happens. But what brands are really looking after today is they know that it's not just by sending messages that people buy. It's about interacting with people and then you uh, natively say like you have to have the outbound message integrated with what you do on the inbound side. Inbound means when I land on Facebook, when I land on your corporate website, it has to be consistent with the message that I just received. And this is typically where the problem comes because if you want to do these interaction things, and interaction really means like it's multi-step processes. I send you something, I look whether or not you react to that. If you don't react, I might send you three days something else. If you come to the website, then I will show you that same message. It's that multi-step part. And if you have these separate channels, it just takes too much work. It's impossible to do. It's what, what Martin called earlier, the work below the neck. It just takes so much time to do it. So at the end of the day, these are then the keywords that the people are looking after, making it customer-centric, integrated inbound and outbound, and multi-step across the channels. And, and just one thing, again, and this is for the people who are not yet into marketing automation, but I can imagine there are quite some um, uh, when you come to such conferences. The difference on how such a system looks is, the only way I put it up is to show you that a marketing automation in the B2C world looks different. It is not anymore about a database and shooting a message out, but it's really like, like flow charts that you see here. Um, and, and typically customers who use B2C marketing automation I would say 50 or 70% from what they do is fully automated because it is dragging people through a funnel. Um, they have such processes for the moment that you subscribe for a newsletter. There is a scenario number one going on, uh, trying to, get to, to make you buy that first product. Once you bought something, there is another scenario starting, trying to get you that repeat buy. If you didn't buy it in the last three months, there is another scenario, and so on and so on. But my point is, marketing automation is about not having to do things with your hands every day, but having the time to think about a strategy and then having a tool to implement that and do it at scale. Um, second thing is what I want to show you here is, that's why I had put these uh, orange things on. You need to have then a channel integration where if you just draw the building block, I shoot a mail out and if he clicks through, he will go to my website and there I want to say this personalized message. It's only if you have such channel integration, that it simplifies the day-to-day -day and that you have the time back in order to think about what the scenario should be instead of producing the scenario by hooking up all different types of systems. That's in essence a bit what I wanted to say about um, marketing automation for those who are not yet deep into it. And then you see typical things, I'll go a bit faster over this, but such things becomes easy then. What is it? It's typical life cycle process. This is a telco operator. Um, when I subscribe for a prepay, what they want me actually to have as a post pay. So there is a messaging process starting out where all the content of the messages are fully personalized on my calling behavior on my prepay card, so they will suggest me the right 
post-based subscription and so on. It's also linking online with what happens in the shop, so I can get messages where I have a personalized discount coupon, can go to the shop, and so on and so on. Just one example. A second example, I'll go quick over it. Such things become easier then as well. It's my birthday, this is a large um, a movie theater chain. I receive a specific coupon with a barcode, I can go to the theater, I get some things for free there. But before they offer me that, uh, I get a link, and from within the same system I can online ask like what are your preferences, what are the types of movies that you like to look at, where do you live, so they know what is your nearest theater. And as a result, because everything is all integrated at that time, the, all the promotional or the standard newsletters that they will get later on, they are completely personalized based on what type of movies do I like to see, where do I live, so what movies are playing actually in the theater that I'm close by to. There were just uh, some examples. But the key thing I want to address is the data part. Um, if you look at what CRM people are using as data today, and it is for those people that I'm addressing mostly, it's still a bit, I would say, the same data as they used 10 years ago. It's data that people fill in at registration, it's data that they, uh, about things they buy, it's a socio demo, surveying you do and so on. But my point is, um, yes, this is very valuable data, and of course, you continue using it, but most CRM people, when, when I talk to them, what they really would like to tap into is this thing. It has been said before also by Martin, 60 to 95% of the time people spend before they make the transaction, they're actually interacting with the brand. And, and the new thing about today is that all CRM people realize that the relation doesn't start with me doing the transaction, even if it's as simple as subscribing for the newsletter. But that used to be the moment when they only come into play, because that's the addressable date. But they would like to tap in earlier, and we would almost say, like, the relation today starts with the first click when you land on your brand website. It means that there is somebody interested. But how, as a CRM person, are you actually able to tap into that? And that's a bit what I want to, to explain. And I would like to do that with a simple charting. And my end goal is that I want to show you how all these things overlap today, where they used to be completely separated. Now, what relationship marketeers, CRM people do is here. Let me perhaps quickly explain. Um, I like to keep things simple in the sense that there are two types of people, people you know and people you don't know. And there are two types of channels, your own channels, that's your email, print that you send out, call centers, and the channels that you have to pay for. And this afternoon we have been talking a lot about channels that you have to pay for, Facebook is one of those. Now, let's say even five years ago, everything that performance marketing did was the pure advertisement side, I pay in order to put a banner on a website. And the closest proxy to knowing who I was targeting was just the website where I placed that banner on. Yeah? Relationship marketing, they deal with, I don't know if you're familiar with the words like PII, it's personal identifiable information. It are the people that you know, using your own channels, you send out emails, you have them called by the call center, you send them out print and so on. Now, a big evolution in the past five years, and it's not even longer than that, is that also in the paid media, they start having a database and saying from now on, it's not the location of the banner, but we know something about the person. And I invite you to, I think one of the last speaker is a person from Exalate. I mean, because this afternoon we've, speak, we've spoken a lot about Facebook, but it's not just only Facebook. It's like in the cookie world, um, they know so much about you because they just tap from all the different sites that, that you visit. And Exalate is a company like that who knows a tons about all of us in this room, but they just don't know our name, and that's what the way they want to have it. But meaning, in the paid media, you can... Um, target whatever audience that you actually want to have. Now, let's talk a bit about these overlaps. Um, what everybody is doing today, I suppose, is like retargeting in the two senses. One sense is what's called display retargeting. That is, people landing on your website, so it's on your own media. Uh, they didn't buy at the end of the day, but you want to continue them, and like in real time, whenever I am on the, whenever I am on the internet, they will follow me. Um, I don't know too much the situation in Dublin uh, or in, in Ireland in general, but you know, where I live, uh, Zalando, if you once look at their shoes, I mean, these shoes follow you for the, the next two, three weeks, and even if you bought them, I mean, you keep on seeing shoes. Well, that's, that's, that's retargeting, so probably the same in, in, in Ireland as well. But the thing is, it works. 
that's why they do it, because it works. Now, the second form of retargeting, that's where the CRM people come back into play. That is where if um, I'm on the website and in some way you were able to identify me, I will come back to that in a minute, um, you could send me an email as a retargeting. Typical example, abandoned shopping baskets. Who is in e-commerce here? Sorry, I have to come back. Do you use abandoned shopping basket retargeting today? Do it, really. It's like, it's like the, key, kick, uh, the key quick win that we always apply the first time. It's about people who had the intention to buy for some reason in the last step like they didn't do it. And then just by sending an email uh, with that same offer and some other upsell offers, it works even better than the display retargeting because the intention of how far those people were in the process is extremely high. Yeah? So that's just retargeting which is done today. Now, towards the CRM people, there is in this left industry, the paid media industry, Today, there are so many clever people there. And it's the fastest evolving industry. And one of the things that they did very smart is they said, you know, instead of only targeting these anonymous people, why not targeting your own customers that you have today or your own contacts that you have in your database? And a couple of examples were already given in the afternoon, but I just want to generalize it to give you that overview. That's called in the industry data onboarding. And I'll give uh, examples in a minute, but first some use cases. A use case is um, you have an email address contact database. You send them emails and you know perfectly who you can't reach anymore and who you do. Um, they might have changed from email address or, or people who are just having a very low response to that part. You can onboard them on Facebook, on Twitter, or on, on the general digital ecosystem. I'll show in a minute. And they will, you, will, you will send their messages when they are tomorrow just online on whatever website. Another one is what I call amplifying your message. You know, there are still some basic things which are always true. It's like repetition is the mother of advertisement, meaning if I receive an email today with a good promotion and tomorrow I start surfing on the internet and I see that same product coming by, it gives this feeling like, hey, this must be something good because the internet is all over about this. But at the end of the day, it's just me seeing that. Amplifying messages is what I call it. Now, some examples of the data onboarding. It is Facebook. I go quickly over it because uh, the person from Nanigans and also Propel had already talked about it. In essence, you upload the email address. They will do the matching. Some typical use cases. Range over here. If that person is a customer already, you give him a discount on purchasing a new one. If he is never a customer, but he just registered for the newsletter, it's a prospect, you just invite him to go for a test drive. These things are starting to become really um, uh, common practice. Who knows LifeRamp? Then I'll explain you a bit about LifeRamp, because this afternoon we've only been talking about advertisement on Facebook and so on, but you know, Facebook is it's very interesting, of course, so many people on there, not about that, but it's not limited to that. LifeRamp is, for, uh, for example, a company who says, I'll extend that to wherever people serve, not just when they are on Facebook. So this is an example of a Toyota who says, I know whose people lease is uh, expiring this month, Yes, I've used my own channels in sending them emails, but I would like them to give that feeling that is really a big opportunity by now choosing for Toyota again. Think amplifying messages. And so when I'm surfing on the New York Times, I all of a sudden see that same thing that was in my mailbox a week ago. It's just like this confirmation of the fact that it must be a good deal. Well, LifeRam is a company who allows to do that. Yeah? Um, Twitter tailored audience. Who knows Twitter tailored audiences after? Yeah. Of course you will, yeah, definitely. Twitter tailored audiences, they were always a bit behind on Facebook. Um, and 2013, they allowed those same mechanisms. Meaning, in general, it's about a conversation that started outside Twitter. You can bring that into Twitter. Meaning, if I land on your website, um, you can send me a promoted tweet tomorrow. Or if I'm in your database and you want to tweet me something on, 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 on Twitter, that means like the email addresses again, you can do that today as well. It's, it's all this idea of like, I, I do not have to follow your brand in order for you to advertise on me on Twitter. It's the same thing like Facebook custom audiences are doing and it's their alternative um, to do exactly the same thing. Now, coming back to this plot. So this has been made easy. Yeah? There is still one quadrant on top there where I believe that the industry is not doing enough. Um, it is the quadrant where, you know, 
at the end of the day, you spend so much money in the paid ecosystem, and the only part where the relationship people take over is when I subscribed or when I bought. But there's so much people just landing on your website um, who represent a lot of potential, but nobody's actually doing something with it. And the reason for that is, I feel it's because the tools which are being used there are the same tools that were used 10 years ago. I mean, previously, I think it was a lady from, from um, Activate, no, Activate, Akia, who said, like, you have all tools in place to do it together. I'm, I'm not completely convinced of that. Because web analytics yeah, is, I make a bold statement, I'm, I do a lot of projects with clients, and I see a lot of um, companies driven from the CRM people who say, we know that we need to tap into our visitors. We, we need to go earlier in the chain. So we know we need to do something with our web analytics. But the reason they say that it is because that's the only common understanding that we have of where do we get data from what's happening on our website. But the bold statement I want to make there is like, it's, it was never made for that, in the sense that um, if, you, if, you, if you are in these conversations and with IT people, IT people ask like, okay, I could get that data out of Omniture, and do I just store that then in the relational database? Um, and then CRM people say, no, I'm not really, because that's just all logs, and I can't really do anything with logs. So the format is not made for relationship people. The second thing is, but that's solvable. I mean, we all have good IT people. It's on a completely different location. I mean, your customer data is on-premise in most cases or in the cloud. It doesn't really matter. But this web analytics data, I don't think you'll get it easily from Google. And you have WebTrans and Omniture and other, and other companies who say, yes, we have APIs and you can get it out. But I don't know if you ever did it. It's always a complex process. It's not made easy enough in order for CRM people to do something with it. But the most key thing is this one. For a CRM person, as long as you can't link something to a customer identity, then it's not useful. And it's just two weeks ago when, when I was in London for a client where we uh, were going to start with. One of the reasons why the CRM people were not able to get any good queries out of their database anymore was because 90% of it was pure containing all transaction logs from the website, driven by a very good and an honest feeling saying we know we need to have that data, but it was never touched. So. What's my message? My message is that um, at the end of the day, we're trying to combine two things which were initially not really designed to fit together. And um, the reason why I explain all this is because I think it's time for this industry, the ones on this side, the tools that you use as a CRM person, that they move up to the chain as well. In a sense that, and this is something where it's something that we're doing, um, and even if it's like a little small pitch, that's not really my goal, but I want to explain you what the value of it is behind. It is a sort of um, tooling where instead of measuring traffic, you're measuring people. It's where you do exactly the same thing. Let me explain a bit here. You know, when I talked about you have two separate worlds, this is the world what we offer today as well, typically what CRM people do. And on the other one, the traffic manager, remember, the direct performance people. But the gap in between is that these people do not know what's happening there. So the thing that, uh, the thing that I want to show is like there is a new evolution in marketing where you put something in between where you measure exactly like what the performance people did, but they do it based on traffic, that you start measuring every individual visitor which hits on the website. So these are just cookie profiles. And, and meaning that what such a system does is it's measuring, um, it, it's building up a profile. So it's not thinking in terms of logs, but it's, trans it's transforming these logs into an actionable profile. Meaning, um, um, we have clients, for example, where they might have like only one million people in a database, but we're following 10 million people on the website. And from each of these persons, we know like um, how often do they come back? And when they come back, uh, how long do they stay? And what's the reason why they come? Uh, so what's the interest that they're looking up to it? And the nice thing is, when I say it has to come from this side of the industry, is because this is what CRM people have, and what they actually want to do is blend the behavioral data together with the offline data that they already have. Because that becomes an interesting combination. Um, a simple use case, for example, is the moment that, or, or maybe to explain what the difference is, because sometimes I get that question, the difference is, 
a Google Analytics will tell you that, for example, today you had like average uh, return rate of, 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 of people is two times a week. Such a system will actually give you that information for every individual. And while a Google Analytics will say you had 500,000 visitors on your website, such a system will say, yes, you had 500,000 visitors on your website, and did you know that only 50,000 of those were people who are currently already in your database? But did you also know that from those 450,000 remaining people, there were 50,000 yesterday who come back every day or every week, and they have an average engagement score of coming to your website every week. So these are typically the people that you say, I want to have them in my database, but as a CRM person, I was never able to reach out to them because you didn't have that information. And that's typically then where you can start targeting on the website when such person comes online. You can very targetly give incentives then. So you say, well, even if he doesn't buy immediately, it's not about direct response. It's about this is a person which is worth spending a certain discount in order to make him just register because once he's in the database, people on this side, they know how to nurture uh, prospects. They know how to bring them to the first, uh, first buy. So, and, and that's a bit completing my picture then where we said, where I said, you know, what everybody is more or less doing is like the retargeting part. There's definitely a tendency to go towards um, profiling what people do on your website. And the use cases are, one that I explained already is, it's a perfect fit for CRM people to grow the database faster with highly qualified people. At the same time, you can connect your CMS system to such um, solutions where you can really do the personalization from within your CMS, but the CMS is made in more intelligent because it knows like, okay, this visitor, tell me what type of person he is, and accordingly, I will say something in the front. But also, you see these little lines towards the retargeting. Because don't forget, if you're in the paid media, you're spending money. And you want that money to be spent as optimal as possible. Most people who do retargeting today have the retargeting pixel always on their website. So every person who hits and obeys a certain criteria will be retargeted. But if you have a system which is able to tell you a lot more about that person, then you will start dynamically setting that retargeting pixel and saying, yes, this is a current customer. Um, I'm going to retarget him. This is a person who has a high engagement with me. Yes, I'm going to retarget. And you can more like optimize the money that you're actually going to spend in the external media. Um, my main message, I'm going to conclude here, my goal was just to show you that the traditional way of thinking in terms of direct response in CRM people, that these things are all merging. Um, I strongly believe that if CRM people would know more about what's possible in the digital ecosystem, that they could start seeing Display or Facebook just as one part of their lifecycle program and just as another channel like the current own channels that they currently use. Um, and that's where I see the tendency that within companies, it really makes sense to have these digital people sit together with the CRM people so they learn more what the possibilities are. And it's all driven by this one thing. It doesn't longer make economic sense to send messages to the many in the hopes to pursue the few. The way of targeting today is far more evolved than it used to be. I don't know if I made it in time. I wanted to keep it short for part.